Azharu will present a talk on Women in Islam, Liberated or Subjugated? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ala al-uqdatan min lisani yafqa qawli. Respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. So when we are talking about today's subject, women in Islam, liberated or subjugated, we have to understand one very important point. And the very important point that we have to understand is the very essence of Islam, the very foundation of this religion. The word Islam itself means submission. Therefore, all Muslims are in a state of subjugation. In fact, every human being who lives in this planet submits into someone or to something. If we think about our ideas of right and wrong, good and evil, what we should do, what we should not do, what is appropriate behavior, what is inappropriate behavior, from where do human beings get these ideas? The first source of information from where we get the ideas of right and wrong, good and evil, what we should do, what we should not do, is from our parents. The second is our scriptures or religions. The third are our friends. How many people in this world do things because their friends want them to do it? Just because their friends are telling them, come on, let's do it, they do it. You are giving into what your friends want you to do. You are giving into what your scriptures, what your religions want you to do. You are giving into what your parents want you to do. Another very powerful source of information, especially in the world today, is the media. So many people are imitating what they see on the TV and what they hear on the radio. So these are just some of the sources of influence. Other thing that influences us and is not from the outside is the nafs. Your passions, your desires, I want this, I want that. That feeling that you want something from your inner self. What I want to do, then you give in to it. You submit to it. You are subjugated by it. If you understand this, my brothers and sisters, we also have to understand every human being is a slave. Every human being is given to someone or to something and nobody can escape it. The West is saying we are a free society. It's a lie. Nobody is free. Everybody is given to someone or to something even if it is just to their own desires. But a Muslim is someone who gives into Allah. We don't even give into our parents unless they tell us to do something good. But if they tell us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? If our government tells us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? If the media tells us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? No. A Muslim is someone who gives into Allah. So we all Muslims are subjugated not to the things of this world and the people of this world. We are subjugated to Allah. Now that we have given the introduction, we have understood the foundation which we Muslims view the world and view society. Let us now take a step back. Let us ask ourselves, why are we even talking on the issue in the first place? Why? Why even bother having to talk on the topic or on the issue of women in Islam, liberated or subjugated? And this is what we want to explore first of all. The reason is because in the world at which we live today, there is an idea 
a concept that has been developing of human rights, that the human beings have certain inviolable rights that is due to their very basic nature as human beings. What do you mean when someone has rights? Because the opposite of someone having rights is that that person is oppressed. So this is what we are talking about, oppression. The opposite of oppression is being given your rights. And now we want to define oppression. What is oppression? What is this subjugation, this oppression? Let us now define it because in order to understand our topic, in order to comprehend it fully, we need to define the terms of what we are talking about. Now the concept of rights is very intimately linked with the idea of the nature of a thing, its nature. Let us take an example. Imagine you had an animal that lives in the night. They are night animals. They live in the night. Their eyes are big and so they can see and they hunt in the night. Imagine you took that animal and you put it in a cage and you kept the lights on it the whole time. You kept it in daylight. And even when night came, you turned the lights on. You will all understand that this is a very oppressive thing to do to that animal because you are keeping it away from its basic nature. Let's take another example, a human example. Let's take the example of a human being who is working very, very hard. Maybe it's manual labor, maybe it's on a computer. It doesn't matter. But this very human being is working very, very hard. And they do this work in order to get what? In order to get their wages, in order to get paid. And we all recognize that it is oppression, that if a human being is working very, very hard and we keep away from them the money, that is due to them. When we have done that, we have oppressed that thing. We don't pay them their wages or the wages that we pay them is less than what they need to feed themselves and their family. So this is what we mean by oppression. Oppression means when you keep something away from what is basic to it. This is a very, very important concept in order for us to understand before we go any further. And one more thing that I want to introduce. The opposite, of course, of oppression is liberation. And I want to take the example of India. As we all know that India was under the yoke of British colonial rule for 300 to 350 years. And the people of India, the Muslim, the Hindu, the Sikh, the atheist, all of them forgot about for a time there are differences in their religions, their creed, and their caste. And they all united in one common purpose. And that common purpose was to get rid of the colonial rule. Because it is the right of the people and the right of the nation that they should have access to their own natural resources. The natural resources of India are not for the British. The primary receivers of that should be the people who live on that land. This is understood. So liberation occurs when we remove that obstacle in order for us to fulfill our rights. Liberation for that little animal when it is given its natural environment. For the worker when he or she is paid their wages. So liberation occurs when their rights are restored. Let us go back to the issue of women. What do we mean by oppression of women? In order to understand whether a woman is oppressed or not, we have to examine and we have to understand whether in any environment, in Islam, the West, East, they are oppressed or not. Because unless we define the nature of the woman, and unless we understand the nature of the woman, we can never make a judgment as to whether any ideology or any religion oppresses her or liberates her. 
The second thing that we want to deal is with the nature of the women as a human being. Historically, and even today, there are some cultures and there are some societies which believe that men and women are the same. In fact, as recently as 150 years, that's only 150 years, a council of Christian bishops and clergy gather together to discuss, does a woman have a soul or not? And if she does have a soul, is it like that of a dog or like that of a slave? These are Christians debating on the issue as recently as 150, 200 years ago. There is no doubt that in some religions and in some cultures and in some societies, they believe that men and women are the same. The woman is not really considered to be a full human being and they are not independent of their rights. And if they are, then they are some type of lesser human being. This is not the case in Islam at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the glorious Quran. This is the same word that I recited in the beginning of my talk. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat For Muslim men and women. Wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat For believing men and women. Wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitat For devout men and women. Wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat for true men and women, wasabirina wasabirat. For men and women who are patient and constant, wal khashiina wal khashiat. For men and women who humble themselves, wal mutasaddiqina wal mutasaddiqat. For men and women who give charity, wasaimina wasaimat. For men and women who fast. For men and women who guard their chastity. Who engage much in Allah's praise. For them has Allah prepared forgiveness and great reward. Allah is mentioning in the glorious Quran that the women have same rights. The women have same rights as the men have rights. The Prophet wasallam said, Women are the twin halves of men. Sunan Abu Dawood, Volume 1, The Book of Purification, Hadith number 236. In the issue of humanity, men and women are equal in the fact that they are human beings with souls, with intellect, with the choice to obey Allah and with the choice to disobey Allah. So there is no doubt that Islam fully recognizes the humanity of the women. There is no doubt about this. So that is the first thing. The second thing that we want to cover is an issue where there is a difference between men and women. The difference is not in our being, human beings, because this is what we share in common. The difference is in our biology. The difference is in a physiological and biological makeup of the male and the female. And this is what differentiates us. Now any religion or any way of life or any ideology or any philosophy or any political system that tells us that men and women are the same, it's oppressive. It's oppressive because it denies the basic fundamental nature of the male and the female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the man with specific capabilities, with specific responsibilities. That's true. Mentally, physically, historically, socially, that's true. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the women with specific capabilities, with specific strengths. That's true. Physiologically, biologically, historically, sociologically, it's true. The second thing that we want to cover is an issue where there is a difference between men and women. The difference is not in our being, human beings, because this is what we share in common. The difference is in our biology. The difference is in our physiological and biological makeup of the male and the female. And this is what differentiates us. Now any religion or any way of life or any ideology or any philosophy, 
or any political system that tells us that men and women are the same, it's oppressive. It's oppressive because it denies the basic fundamental nature of the male and the female. So there are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the men better at. And there are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the women better at. Generally, most of the men are physically stronger than the women. And it's true. Until now, I didn't hear of any man giving birth to a child. So we find that naturally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the man with specific capabilities that the woman does not have it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the women with specific capabilities that the man does not have. The fact is, without the men there would be no women, and without the women there would be no men. We shouldn't look at it as a battle of sexes, because it is not. We should help each other, and we should combine our strengths, and we should try to overcome our weaknesses. But my point here is that men and women have been created with different capabilities and different responsibilities. And whichever society refuses to acknowledge that, it's oppressive. Thus, the West is oppressive, but not Islam at all. Because Islam fully recognizes the nature of the man and the nature of the woman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Men are the protectors and maintainers of women. And because of one more strength than the other, and because they support them from their means. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined the roles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a man with specific capabilities. And he is supposed to be the protectors and maintainers. And they should spend of their money and their wealth in order to protect, provide and maintain the women. And thus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the man a degree. And I don't say a degree. We should be careful in this idea of superiority and inferiority. The Prophet sallallahu said that the men have been given the authority over the women. And the obedient wife are those who are devoutly obedient to their husbands. And they guard in their absence what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked them to guard. This is the description of good and believing women. The reason you should obey the husband, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the man to be the shepherd over you and over the family. And he is the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask on the day of judgment. If he is good and kind to his wife, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best among you are those who are best to their wives. And the Prophet sallallahu said, And I am best to my wives. Surah Ibn Majah, Volume 3, The Book of Marriage, Hadith number 1977. And the Prophet sallallahu used to sew his own clothes when they were broken. And he used to milk the goats. And he used to attend all his affairs at home. And when he was not out giving dawah or teaching in the masjid, he would come home and serve his family. This is what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. But sisters, if you look at the best of the women, and if you look at the women that were mentioned by Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, Asiya, the wife of Firan, Maryam, the mother of Isa ﷺ, Fatima, the daughter of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and Khadija, the wife of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. If we examine specifically Khadija and Fatima, look at Khadija. Yes, Khadija was a businesswoman. And this is not why she was praised for. This is not why she was made and given high status for. But it was the example as her wife. Her way that she supported Rasulullah when no one believed in him. When the Prophet got the first revelation, he came running to Khadija radiallahu anha. And she was the one who reassured him, who helped him through her words, with her love, with her wealth, with everything she had. This is the example of Khadija and Fatima, the most noble of the Muslim women, along with Khadija, Maryam, and Asiya.
But if you look at their qualities, what was it? As doctors, people with PhDs, is this what Allah honored the women with? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored the women with being a wife and with being a mother. This is the dignity that Islam gives to women. This is the honor that Islam gives to women. And this is my brothers and sisters, a lofty station. The Prophet sallallahu said, if any woman prays her salah, makes her fasting, guards her chastity, and obeys her husband, she will enter paradise by whichever gate she chooses. Sayyul Jame, volume one, hadith number 640. This is the benefit, this is the level, this is the high station of the women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the glorious Quran, reverence Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and revere the wombs that bow you. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 1. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the mother along with himself. The care that is due to the mother, the respect that is due to the mother. When a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O oh Allah's messenger, who is the most entitled to be treated with a companionship by me? The Prophet sallallahu replied, Your mother. Who is next? Your mother. Who is next? Your mother. The man asked for the fourth time, Who is next? The Prophet replied, Your father. Sahih Bukhari, Volume 8, The Book of Good Manners, Hadith number 5971. Islam gives women their true humanity. Islam gives women their true nature. And as we find yesterday, and again we find today, that Islam is the only religion, the only true religion that brings true peace and true happiness to the individual or the society. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.